As the saying goes, when water is limited, the important things get washed. If you're not spending time on your armpits and crotch because you're too busy trying to rub water on your toes, like you're missing the plot. Guys, today we're gonna to talk about an underground strength legend. Pavel Satsulin has written over a dozen books on strength training, kettlebells, conditioning. He's worked with some of the biggest names in the field. He's been on the Joe Rogan experience. He's been around for decades. And we're going to cover his book, Power to the People, because it really paints a pretty clear, concise, minimalist version of strength training. Now, to be clear, I'm not recommending that everybody ditch what they're doing right now to do this, which is arguably the most simplistic, straightforward program ever concocted. But I think studying things like this can really help you recenter and figure out what the important stuff about your training is, especially when you move forward and you start adding on more things, adding bits of complexity, it all gets so daunting. So going back to basics and rec uh, reminding yourself of what the minimum stuff that is actually driving a progress forward is, is so helpful. So we're gonna break this down. This is Pavel Satsulin's Power to the People, probably the most simple strength training program ever conceived. So one of the reasons I like Pavel in his writings is that he does a good job of simplifying things. That's a big one. He makes it accessible. The book, I mean, it's called Power to the People. He's always playing on this Soviet dynamic and he you know, says comrade over and over and he talks about the party always being right. So he plays into that, which is kind of funny, but really it's the accessibility, you know, redistribution of gains across the people. So it's not about what the best Olympic lifter in the world is gonna do or what the guy chasing that powerlifting all-time total is gonna do. It's about your average Joe who has a life and who wants to get stronger and should be able to get a lot stronger, a lot more useful, a lot more muscular, what should that person focus on? And in our search for optimal, we forget that true optimal training is you doing that as your day job. It's you refining things and adding things to the point where you don't really have room for anything else. And that's where Olympic lifters live on a compound, have a stipend, and that's all they do all day, every day. Even a pro bodybuilder is gonna talk about how their entire life is prepping meals, taking naps, and training, and that's all of it. So for the rest of us, we have to know how much we can peel away from that while still being able to get as good as we potentially want to get. And then as you go off into the future, you can figure out if it's worthwhile to stack more and more and more. So the simplicity, the accessibility is absolutely great. Also, he does a really good job of breaking down the bare bones of like physiology, just kind of glossing over uh, strength training as an academic field and what we know about what causes strength and what modes of training tend to be most productive. So this book by itself is a really good overview for those of you that haven't really gotten into the weeds about why strength training operates the way it does. So as an overview, we're talking about strength. So we're talking about good developmental movements, stimulating your nervous system, making sure you're working in a range that does that, that focuses on the nervous system and your ability to recruit more motor units and implementing an appropriate amount of recovery, an appropriate split, and some recommendations that fit your life and that are going to allow you to be flexible without derailing everything. So how many exercises does he recommend? Exactly two, a deadlift and a one-arm press. He includes some other stuff, curls and some deadlift variations. All this stuff is stuff you can do with a barbell, and an open floor space. It's not even a rack or a bench required, literally just a bar and plates. So the deadlift we know is a great movement. You deadlift over time, your weight goes up. That means you can do a lot more things that you couldn't when you started. And it means you're going to have synthesized pounds and pounds of lean muscle tissue that correlates with those strength gains. A one-arm press, and I can absolutely see a press complementing a deadlift. If we only have two exercises to get your whole body as strong as possible, he argues that you can get your whole body into it. So using more musculature, not less, is key for developing strength, especially whole body strength. So as you kind of cock your hips, lean to the side, press away from it, stand up, you can load that up with quite a bit of weight. So I get the rationale. I'm not entirely sure that I would tell everybody to stop military pressing in favor of the one-arm press. Using these two main movements, the sets and reps, two by five, that's it. And I prescribe something very similar in a lot of my workouts, but it tends to be surrounded with more overall volume. But this is a top set of five followed by a back offset, 10% down, token set of five, that's your work, that's what you're progressing forward. So two exercises, two sets, it's not a lot of work in a workout. And the idea is that you can do this more frequently. So that brings us to the question of frequency. How often should you do this? 
what amount of time do you have available? He gives a recommendation that you don't do more than five sessions in a week, but you can do as few as one or two. And the idea is that it's kind of cyclical. It goes back and forth. And that's one of the things I really like about this is that you don't have to white knuckle your training. If you painted out a long macro cycle that's pointing towards a contest, yeah, you got to hit those deadlines because everything's pointed towards one singular performance. So timing is important. But if we're just training any time where you can't get in the gym as much, that's time that you can recover more than you otherwise wouldn't have been able to. And conversely, when you do have a lot more free time and you can train a lot harder, that's time where you can build up fatigue in anticipation of that next break you get. And that back and forth, that's essentially what periodization is. The difference is we like to white knuckle our periodization. We like to have everything laid out. We like to know in advance exactly what our workouts are gonna look like. And that's how we throw wrenches in our own training because you can't always predict. And we lose our shit if we have an off workout. We lose our shit if we um, miss a workout. The truth is we have a lot of elasticity with the way we respond to training. We can truck forward, pushing, 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 spre uh, spreading ourselves thin. And eventually that tension is gonna get taken out between our recovery and the work that we're doing. And it's gonna get pulled tight. If we stop, there's kind of a delayed effect where that recovery catches up with us. So the bottom line is times where you are bashing your head against the wall, overreaching, overtraining, you can do that for a, a little while before it catches up with you. And time where you can't quite get into the gym, it takes a while to detrain. In that time, you might actually be getting stronger because you gave your body a break. So it's kind of cool that he has a lot of flexibility in here. If there's a week you can only get in once or twice, who cares? If there's a week where you can get in five times, great, go for it but because you're on this higher frequency approach and you're doing the same two movements so frequently, it's not so important that it be done on this really strict timeline. Guys, if I can help fund this channel and help you solve a problem, I call that a win-win. So please allow me one moment to preach the good word of Boost Camp. I tend to get a little complex when I'm writing workout plans. Tracking progress for these programs is hugely important, but options were never great. I would write these long, complex progressions by hand into a notebook, or I would carry a binder filled with spreadsheets I printed off of LiftVault. That's why I'm here to introduce you to Boost Camp. Boost Camp is the easy way to track training progress directly from your phone. Their library of programs features countless dozens of powerlifting and hypertrophy specific programs from your favorite creators, including Jeffrey Verity Schofield, Johnny Candido, Eric Helms, Greg Knuckles, Alberto Nunez, and of course, yours truly. Boost Camp also has exclusive programs that you just won't find anywhere else. Select the one best suited to your needs and watch the sets, reps, weights, and exercises populate automatically. Don't guess at that one weight you lifted that one time for how many reps again? Have your log of training with you at all times for easy reference in the convenience of your phone. Not only does Boost Camp have a stellar product, but their support is the only reason this channel exists. So thank you, the viewer, and thank you to Boost Camp. Check it out today. The link is in the description. So that brings us to cycling, what he calls the secret. Uh, before, it used to be just go in and train hard. And every week, you train as hard as you can. Every session, you train as hard as you can. And obviously, what you would expect, what we know now, that burns you out, that keeps stress, fatigue too high for too long. You can't catch up, you get overuse issues. So certainly some guys have gotten very strong doing that, but over a bunch of people, you're just so likely to run into a wall. It's just so easy to address that by engaging in something like cycling. Periodization, it's very similar. You're alternating periods of very high intense work with periods of less work, more recovery, or you're focusing on something else entirely. So principally they're the same. So let's start with the simplest iteration of progression. And Pavel talks about this in his book. You have linear progression, start with three by five, five by five, one by 20, nine by three, whatever it is, your sets and reps. And all you do is every time you come in, you do a little bit more, five pounds every time. You can do that for so long on a novice program. You can actually do that for months. And it's boring, it's kind of monotonous, but it works very well. The loading of weight continuously, it teaches you a good habit. Keep everything the same, just change this one variable. Now, eventually when you do hit that wall, if you didn't know what to do, you would think, well, every time I come in just for the rest of my life, I have to go as hard as possible. And actually you're better off if you go back to the beginning, build back up again. So. Understanding that as people change, 
the the rate at which they adapt changes, the time they can spend doing really, really hard shit changes. So you tend to see some other little tricks come in, like, well, maybe we can wave. So instead of going all the way back to day one where we're doing a bunch of weeks of work that's way too easy, maybe we can stutter. We can drop back a little bit, build back up, drop back a little bit. And that's like a wave progression. Then you have step progressions, which is keeping the weight the same. And after you acclimate to the weight for a few sessions, you can level up. Now, you might look at these and recognize like a wave progression, five through one's a wave progression. It's a dedicated pure wave progression. Linear progression is a dedicated progression. You have like starting strength and strong lifts. The thing is, Pavel doesn't give a shit about doing something purely uh, step loading, purely linear progression. The examples he gives shows what that might look like, but in the same vein of the frequency kind of fitting whatever you can do that week, you should instinctively be making maneuvers based on what you think is necessary to keep going. So he gives examples in the book of what the progressions look like. Let's say you're starting at 200 pounds and you add five pounds until you fail to hit five on that top set of five. Well, you might do a complete reset. That's just a complete cycle. You go all the way back to square one, build back up. Now you got some more momentum, all these sessions, you're a little bit stronger. So now instead of a double, you hit it for four. That's a pretty big improvement, but you're still not ready yet. Now, instead of revisiting all of those light workouts, instead you're like, well, let me wave. Let me just wave back a little bit, not a ton, just a little bit. So you go back to 210, you start building back up and you're like, you know what? I want to spend some more time at these heavy weights that I'm not used to. So maybe you repeat the weight a couple weeks in a row. And then maybe as you feel more confident, then you decide to really start aggressively chasing weight again, you hit this new PR. So it's this continuous ebb and flow, building up stress, building up stress, taking your foot off the gas, letting yourself clear out. In that time, you're going to grow, your body will super compensate. And then by the time you get heavy again, now you're ready to go, you can hit the gas again. And it's this back and forth ebb and flow. And if you get a good intuition, for how many weeks you have left at a particular effort or with a particular movement or in a particular rep range. The question of what you should do in something more advanced like block periodization, what you should do in a definite mesocycle is going to be so stupidly easy to answer. And that's what so many people struggle with because they jump into those more advanced forms of training. Now, I'm not going to recommend this if you are getting ready for a contest. This is something you do off season or if you're not competing at all. If you have months or years to grow, glue yourself to the progression. Remember, I want you guys repeating this in your sleep. The progression is more important. This is what grows you. Everybody gets optimal training brain and they focus on the exact right volume, the exact number of sets and reps, the exact RP. God forbid you hit the wrong RIR, your whole training is going to be derailed. That's not the case. So many things work, which is why so many people train so many different ways. The important thing, long-term, you've done the optimal training over six weeks, you saw all this growth, but then six weeks after that, you haven't seen any growth. And then six months after that, you haven't seen any growth. The thing that keeps whatever training arrangement you're doing going is how you progress and the fact that you make it sustainable. So the rate at which you move forward, the rate at which you uh, pull the stress back and let yourself catch up, that's it. And that's why you can do something so silly, so simple, like two sets of five over a couple exercises and progress. So to any of you who are running a program that you are comfortable with, you're chipping away, you're getting better, I'm not telling you to ditch that to go do this. Like this extreme isn't required for getting back to your roots, but this is useful as a thought experiment when you think when time and resources are completely limited, what are the important things that I can still lean on to grow? As the saying goes, when water is limited, the important things get washed. If you're not spending time on your armpits and crotch because you're too busy trying to rub water on your toes, like you're missing the plot. So the important thing to keep in mind as you move forward and once progress stalls and you feel stuck or you're not quite sure what to do, remember the exact number of exercises you're doing, the specific type of exercises, the exact split, the exact number of sets and reps, the specific RIR that you work to in each training program is not what all of your progress from here till the end of your training career hinges on. It is the way that you take that amount of work and build forward on it. Your ability to progress and make the progress sustainable is exactly what training is. So it's nice to be able to drop back to something like this. It's a little calming. I find it calming to remember that when I am stuck, when all the training feels daunting and I'm overwhelmed, that I really can look back at the basics, remind myself what is driving my training forward, 
and it just simplifies everything and it makes my next moves so completely clear. Now, when you do get into more complex forms of training, those all have learning curves that you're going to have to navigate separately. But this stuff is the foundation. It's like I said before, when you know how to progress a program, like you can anticipate whether you're going to hit that top set next week. You can anticipate if I give myself just another week or two with this weight, I know I'm going to see a breakthrough. And that is so freeing when you do commit to something with a deadline, like a set mesocycle, a set block of training that fits into these different blocks. The pacing is where people get so stuck and it becomes so easy. You just know the range that you're working in for this block, the adaptations you're looking for, and you can pace the improvements day in, day out until the end of that block. And you can time it so that you're at that right crescendo where I'm just at that unsustainable amount of work. I'm just starting to overreach. And then we pull back and I go into this different phase and I build on top of that. And that's really all periodization is. That's what it comes down to. Don't be overwhelmed by the fact that there's so many different ways of doing it. That should tell you how many different productive methods there are. So this is my coverage of Pavel Satsuline's Power to the People, the simplest training program ever concocted. I'm going to be doing a lot more about simplified, really distilled down methods like this that make more use out of a little because I really feel like we're long overdue to go back to the drawing board and remind ourselves of the foundational principles that drive your training forward. And from there, we can build on this other stuff. We can talk about how accessories fit on top of this. We can talk about how to make this sustainable when we're adding more moving pieces. And that's how we get to something that is an intelligently thought out machine that does exactly what we want it to and not some mishmash of whatever the last thing we were exposed to happens to be. So that's all I got for today, guys. Thanks so much for watching. Until next time, this is Bromley. I'll see you.